Hello neighbor, I'm Robert Burns and welcome back to another edition of Sound Off Louisiana. We've had several new uh, members to uh, add on to our subscription list in recent weeks. We want to welcome all of you aboard. Uh, for those of you have, who have been around for at least a few months, you will recall that about two or three months ago we, would, we did a several series uh, with regard to Governor Edwards' attempt to cram down the legal services of uh, Larry S. Bankston, a good friend of his, uh, onto the contractor's board. Now, the way that's being accomplished is that uh, Larry Bankston has filed suit against our Attorney General, Jeff Landry. Uh, Mr. Landry denied Mr. Bankston being reappointed uh, to serve as legal counsel for the contractor's board, uh, and that did not sit well with Mr. Bankston, nor did it sit well, obviously, with Governor Edwards. Uh, and so Mr. Bankston filed a lawsuit uh, in January of this year against the Attorney General. Uh, it initially was a, a, an injunction to try to uh, get Mr. Landry to, or Attorney General Landry, to issue written reasons as to why he was not being, uh, re his contract was not being renewed. Uh, Mr. Landry went ahead and supplied those written reasons, thereby making the, the function of that lawsuit uh, moot. Uh, and so uh, there was a, a, uh, a motion to amend the petition. Uh, and so at this point, uh, the, the, uh, Mr. Bankston is basically looking for a writ of mandamus, that is a mechanism by which a governmental entity is forced to do a certain act, uh, calling for him to be named as the attorney for the contractor's board. Uh, and uh, he is suing Jeff Landry uh, in his official capacity as the attorney general uh, for the state of Louisiana, and, and we gave you some thought features on that. We'll give you the links to those early features for some of our more recent viewers so you can go back and take a look. Uh, but on Monday, uh, May the 7th, there will be another court hearing uh, on the matter uh, because uh, the Attorney General has, has uh, filed some exceptions uh, to uh, Mr. Bankston's efforts in those regard, and there court hearing will be at 9.30 if it doesn't get um, uh, po postponed or pushed back because that happens a lot. Uh, but if not, uh, it will be Monday, May the 7th at 9.30. We will certainly be there and uh, we'll give you the follow-up on how that transpired. But I wanted to just bring you up to speed on some of the more recent filings that the Attorney General has made with regard to that litigation because I think they're quite revealing. Um, now, I'm going to give a, a, a basically a memorandum uh, that explain their opposition to um, Mr. Bankston serving as that attorney because much of the most recent filings with regard to the exceptions uh, are duplicative of uh, the context of those. And, and I'll be blunt with you when the legislature in its illustrious wisdom uh, raised the fee to a dollar a page of, of getting uh, clerk of court uh, uh, pages, uh, I became a little bit more selective. I'm going to be blunt with you because it adds up. Uh, the, what We're going to give you the full memorandum. That was about 20 pages. Well, you can do the math. That's $20. I, you know, I didn't see a need to go ahead and, and also buy these most recent uh, filings because, like I said, they are substantially duplicative. But let's go ahead and cover. Uh, I, I, we've got the entirety of the memo, but I've also, as you will see right below this video, giving you some of the highlights, and we're going to just take a look at them today. And and uh, you're you're welcome to uh, you're welcome to read the entirety. But I think I've captured most of the main points. And uh, if you go to page two of the memorandum, and says the Attorney General expressed reservations regarding the board's employment of Bankston's and Associates, stemming from Mr. Bankston's prior felony convictions and his subsequent suspension from the practice of law and his disbarment. While these issues alone were sufficient grounds to reject the board's prior contract with Bankston and Associates, the Attorney General's office nevertheless approved the contract in light of a strong endorsement of Mr. Bankston by the Governor's office. Okay? When I told you that Mr. Uh, Governor Edwards is trying to cram this down everyone's throat, I'm in it. And uh, you know, you've you've seen a number of highly questionable, let's put it that way, appointments uh, that Governor Honor Code has made. This being one of them, uh, you've seen the Calvin Braxton situation. You've seen appointments we talked about on the auctioneer's licensing board. Uh, we, 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 I'm recommending Jacob uh, Brown, who now folks can't even find. Uh, who has stiffed a bunch of consigners and didn't turn over valid title. 
on uh, 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 vehicles. You saw uh, Terrence Lockett, a two-time DWI offender who was so, also sued by the ethics board. I mean, for somebody who touted that honor code of I do not lie, cheat, steal, nor tolerate those who do, it is becoming increasingly, it is looking increasingly like that sort of thing is the only thing he tolerates. That if you don't have this sort of thing, you're going to get kicked off this board or this commission, or you're not going to get this appointment because the it would be one thing if it was just a one-time aberration, but this governor is repeatedly putting on these types of dubious characters. And I would therefore, that's why we have the whole website, jbefraud.com, because I'm here to tell you what he said in those campaign slogans of, I don't, I don't lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those who do. It has now unequivocally been proven to be a pure D fraud. All right. I said all that to say this, the emphasis on it being the governor who is pushing this. I mean, sure, the names on the petition, uh, you know, will say Jeff Landry and Larry Bankston. Trust me, it may as well say John Bell Edwards. He's trying to flex his muscle here, and just like he has lost on the Louisiana Supreme Court decision about the transgendered folk using the restroom, costing us hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to defend against his illegal attempt to usurp the Constitution and make himself God, uh, he will also lose on here. Take, take it to the bank. All right, and let's look at the next paragraph. Mr. Bankston's actions in, advi in advising the board have raised additional concerns regarding his appointment. This is after, all right, as a legal representative of the state of Louisiana. Mr. Bankston failed to disclose to the board a conflict of interest related to his advice given to the board regarding a contract to manage the state's $1.6 billion flood recovery program. The board acted on advice from Mr. Bankston, which would have resulted in an award of approximately $350 million to an entity affiliated with Mr. Bankston's son. Ultimately, the governor's office opted to rebid the contract, but only after considerable delays in the state flood recovery program. Moreover, Mr. Bankston's conduct in regards to the recovery program bids resulted in substantial adverse publicity and it created at a minimum the appearance of impropriety. It also cast doubt about the state's handling of the flood recovery efforts. This resulted in a lawsuit against the board. That lawsuit was filed by the bidder that Mr. Bankston tried to kick out, the one who beat the next uh, highest, the next lowest bid by about $45 million, that being IEM. Uh, and Mr. Bankston deemed them to be unqualified because they didn't have a contractor's license, uh, and they wound up, he disqualified the top two uh, and inserted the third firm who happened to employ his son, which he neglected to mention. Mr. Bankston's conflict of interest, that would be the son being employed I just told you about, Mr. Bankston's conflict of interest even garnered damaging attention for the state on a national scale when during congressional hearings, the governor was asked about Mr. Bankston's questionable involvement in the contracting process. We previously gave that feature literally and we have the video footage of it. We're gonna give you a link. It was an absolute embarrassment to the state of Louisiana. And the very fact that John Bell Edwards could stand, could sit at that table, and when he was asked about that question about Mr. Bankston's son, say, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I've heard that. Well, either you were lying, Mr. Edwards, Governor Edwards, which you say you won't do, or it's inexcusable ineptitude that you could be on a national stage like that and not have that information. The reality is you knew damn well that it employed his son. You just didn't want to say it on a national level because it make you look bad. Well, you made yourself look even worse, and that video will clearly show it, and we're going to give everyone the link for it. Now, Mr. Bankston's contract had expired on July 30, I'm, I'm going on to page three, on July 31st of 2017, the Attorney General sent a letter to the board expressly rejecting the proposed amendment to the contract. Uh, prior to receipt of the January 30th, 2018 letter from the Attorney General or the filing of the underlying lawsuit, the board took action to hire another attorney. If you go back and look at the feature that I gave you, I, I made reference to them hiring Kevin Langeno, who is one of the best contract law attorneys I know of in this state. If you skip on down to page three, it talks about the applicable law. And it states that all, and they put it in bold, all legal services are under the supervision, control, and authority of the Attorney General's office. Now we're going to skip on to page 11, where it says, Mr. McDuff, Mr. McDuff is the Executive Director for the Contractors Board. 
I'm reading from the middle of page 11. It is highlighted. Mr. McDuff's email and letter are in response to the Attorney General's letter to the board dated January 30th, 2018, in which the Attorney General expressed uh, rejected the amendment to the contract between Banks and Associates and the board. Mr. McDuff describes the duties and services it needs from counsel to the board, and then Mr. Duff's letter closes by stating, quote, as a result of your denial to renew the previous approval of Mr. Larry Bankston to serve as our legal counsel, we have retained Mr. Kevin Langerno, I told you he's one of the best construction law attorneys I know of in the state, of Seal and Ross's counsel. His contract has been approved by your office. This letter conveys this, no, we're talking, no, that's the end of the quotation from the letter. Now we're back to the, 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 the memorandum. Uh, this letter conveys several distinct points. First, the board obviously does not have any desire to be involved in this litigation and despite, I'm sorry, and dispute filed by its former counsel, Bankston and Associates, seeking to obtain approval for an amendment to extend the contract. In his email, Mr. McDuff even makes this clear, stating, quote, we have differences of opinion relative to the competency and skills of Mr. Bankston. However, our desire is to agree to disagree and move forward on this matter. Secondly, end quote. Secondly, Mr. McDuff, Mr. McDuff's letter shows that the board has already replaced Bankston and Associates with legal counsel that the board believes satisfactory to render legal services it requires, showing as bright as day that contrary to plaintiff's allegations, the board is not suffering any irreparable harm by the lack of the approved counsel. The, in fact, I would say not only are they not suffering irreparable harm, I'd say they, they have had a, quite an enhancement because I have repeatedly said this, Kevin Landro is about his, the best construction law attorney you can find in this state. I've had past dealings with him to know that of which I speak during my 10-year real estate auction career. The minutes of the November 15, 2017 commercial board meeting show that the board voted to retain Seal and Ross as legal counsel for the board to be effective on December 1st, 2017. In fact, the contract with Seal and Ross was executed and approved by the attorney long before plaintiff's suit was filed. All right, so let's skip on down to page 14. It brings up another court case. This is Mural versus Edwards. Now, when they refer to Edwards there, they're talking about the former longtime governor, the four-term governor, Edwin Washington Edwards. And we're looking at page 14 now. In Mural versus Edwards, the plaintiffs contended that the governor should be compelled to select and appoint members to local boards from a list submitted by regional nominating council. Kind of similar to what Mr. Bankston's asserting, you ought to be compelled to name me as the attorney. Now, what did the court rule in that? Highlighted down at the bottom, the first court noted that despite the language in the statute, the governor was not compelled to appoint a person whom he deemed unqualified. Clearly, Mr. Landry has assessed Mr. Bankson as unqualified and unfit to serve as that attorney. Just similarly to, they said the right that Governor Edwards would have the right to make such a determination, so too does Attorney General Jeff Landry, and he has made it abundantly clear that he does not believe Mr. Bankston is suitable uh, to serve as the attorney for the contractors board. Uh, going to the top of page 15, it says, we hold that the governor cannot be compelled by mandamus, which is what's being sought by Mr. Bankston. We hold that the governor cannot be compelled by mandamus to appoint members to the local boards. The act of appointing is a discretionary, and that is a key word, and I'll explain why in a minute, the act of appointing is a discretionary decision, not a mandatory ministerial duty. As such, no mandamus will be issued. You, in order to prevail in a writ of mandamus, which is what Mr. Bankson is attempting to do, you must demonstrate that the state or the public body has no discretion, period. You have to prove that. It is unquestioned that Attorney General Jeff Landry has discretion on whether or not to approve Mr. Bankston's contract. Mr. Bankston is dead on arrival with this suit, and you would figure as an astute attorney, he's bringing his own legal skills into question by merely filing this suit. All right. Skip on down to the next paragraph. The true claim of plaintiff for a writ of mandamus is improper. <laughs> not only under the constitutions and statutes of this state, but also under jurisprudence. Skip on down to the second to last paragraph. 
uh, a reflection of the exercise of discretion which rests with the Attorney General by virtue of the constitutions and laws of this state. Now I want to proceed on to page 16. And the reason that I want to do this is because it can dovetail into another feature that we've been covering for you. If you look at page 16 toward the middle, it says the plaintiff has no right of action. The right is vested solely with the board or commission who submits the contract for review under the state. Other words, if the contractor's board wanted to sue, saying, hey, you've denied us the attorney, they may have that right. Still wouldn't cause solve the problem that the attorney general has discretion, but the point is they would at least have standing, okay? Mr. Bankston has no standing to file this lawsuit, all right? And that's what the next paragraph says. A party seeking injunctive relief must have standing to sue. Mr. Bankston does not. Uh, now, I want to just say one thing. You know, Jeff Landry gets a lot of complaints, his office does, about you're not, work, you're not acting on this, you're not acting on that, you're not, you know, and look, the simple fact of the matter is there's only so many man hours available, okay? And if he didn't have to wait, this is all internal folk that had to do all of this, okay? It wasn't outside counsel. You know, if you didn't have to waste time with such foolishness as this, it would be a lot easier for him to get to the matters that are legitimate, because this is completely illegitimate, okay? And to have to waste taxpayer time, energy, and effort, it's no different than Governor Edwards on his his mission from on high with regard to cramming uh, transgendered individuals into using the restroom of their choice. He failed miserably on that, and he's going to fail miserably here, even though it's in the form of Larry Bankston. Um, now, I told you a moment ago that I wanted to briefly, as we concluded that, we talked about having to have standing to file a lawsuit. Many of you will remember not long back, the new, the very newest viewers won't, but we did a detailed feature on uh, Stephen Street uh, and the fact that uh, all of the evidence that he has obtained by way of a search warrant against Nate Kane, the, the uh, former warden of Avoyles Correctional Facility, uh, has been challenged by the defense attorney, John McClendon, uh, on the basis that it, the contention is made that the, uh, the uh, inspector general's office does not have search warrant authority. Uh, as I told you, the matter was taken under advisement. Obviously, the U.S. Attorney has been left with no choice but to try to argue that they do have search warrant authority. Uh, many of you may recall that uh, State District Judge Brenda Ricks uh, ruled in the Corey De La Husse matter that they did not have search warrant authority. So far, she's the only judge who's gone ahead and made an emphatic ruling in that regard. Uh, when it was appealed to the First Circuit, uh, the First Circuit did not rule on the constitutionality, I'm sorry, they didn't rule on whether or not the in Inspector General's office has search warrant authority, but instead remanded it back down to the First Circuit and told, I'm sorry, to 21st JDC, Brenda Ricks's courtroom, and said, we want you to conduct a hearing on the constitutionality of uh, the search. Uh, and I think, well, I don't think I pretty much know. Stephen Street saw the handwriting on the wall, and so he and Scott Perillo, the in, in tandem, the district attorney for 21st JDC, they decided to just drop all the charges against Corey De La Husse because they think they saw very clearly where this was going to go. Uh, and so, there, as Stephen Street was so quick to point out to me when I had challenged him in press club, there is no court ruling that says we don't have search warrant authority. He's true on that, but only because he didn't have guts enough to go back there and do what the First Circuit instructed him to do. So now here we are in federal court, and I gave you the memorandums, we'll give you the link that I had previously submitted about whether or not Stephen Street's lack of understanding of the doctrine of lenity and so forth uh, may result in Nate Kane walking. And we gave you the memorandums in that piece, uh, both McClendon's arguments that the, the Inspector General does not have search warrant authority, as well as the U.S. government's attempt uh, to say that they do. Bringing you up to, to date on that court case, because we're tying it directly into this business about having standing, uh, the judge is apparently going to have his decision ride on whether or not Nate Kane 
has standing to challenge the search warrant. Uh, and he did so in a ruling. Uh, we'll give you a link for the ruling. Uh, and uh, he had each side, uh, he had uh, McClendon need, had to submit a memorandum uh, to support why he would believe that Nate Kane would have standing to challenge the search warrant. And he, the judge had cited cases that said you had to have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, and that comes into question here because uh, the house that Nate Kane and his wife lived in was on prison grounds and it is owned by the state of Louisiana. Uh, it's got to be unnerving to Stephen Street that the potential for this thing to blow up as so many cases have on his watch is very real as long as this judge ends up uh, being convinced that Nate Kane has standing to challenge uh, the, the, the search, um, to challenge the constitutionality of the search. From my own vantage point, I will be very frustrated if it's deemed that he doesn't have standing because, as, and I have said this before and I'm going to say it again, as far as I'm concerned, the only standing, the only qualification to have standing to challenge a search warrant by Stephen Street, because bear in mind, what's at issue here is whether the body, the agency, has search warrant authority. The only qualification that ought to be required is that you be a citizen of this state, okay? Because this office, that Inspector General's office, falls directly under the governor. And as I have said before, Stephen Street will, or, or potentially any other Inspector General, but I can tell you Stephen Street has done it, okay, can use that as the strong arm of the governor, all right, to go after someone that that governor has an issue with. He did it, Bobby Jindal did it with Murphy Painter, he did it with Corey Delahousse, and so I, I, any, as far as I'm concerned, because it could be you, it could be you next week, you know, and you say, oh, that couldn't happen, don't, they, don't, don't, don't be so quick, all right? I can tell you why, but I won't make this video too long, but I do, I am extremely uncomfortable with, with an agency that reports directly to the governor who has an inspector general who is nothing but a lackey for the governor having the authority to come in and search your home. They did it at 6 a.m. with Corey Delahousse. Never mind that Corey Delahousse is not even a covered agency. All right? He had no authority whatsoever to even be in Corey's house. And I'll tell you what, Corey's house is privately owned. So what do you bet Corey Delahousse had a reasonable expectation of privacy and not to have his uh, a guns drawn raid done on his home at 6 a.m. But that's, we'll give you the update when, they, when the judge makes the determination about whether or not Nate Kane has standing to challenge the constitutionality of the search and then whether or not it is deemed unconstitutional. But again, Stephen Street has got to be having some anxiety about all the problems that take place with one investigation after another that he does. So we will update you on after the Monday court hearing with regard to Jeff Landry. We'll also update you on the Nate Kane situation. For those of you who have recently joined our, our, our subscriber list, we want to welcome you. Uh, we appreciate all the kind words that have been said. I think you're getting a service that uh, goes into a depth and a level that you're not going to get on just a regular news medium. Uh, we're able to do that. I think the, the, the camera aids that. I wish we could take a camera into courtrooms, but we can't. Uh, but, but at any rate, we try to bring to you as much of court proceedings uh, as, as transpiring there. So this is Robert Burns thanking you so much for tuning in for this episode, and we'll look to see you again real soon.